use the main toolbar for efficiency. Whenever a main toolbar option is available to you, it's faster to use than using the main menu. So let's go through each of the items on the main toolbar. On the left hand side, the first set of items deal with capturing traffic. The first button lists the available capture interfaces. Now notice that at this time, the third item over that would just automatically start a live capture is not active. And that's because there are no default interfaces selected. Notice that if I list the available interfaces and choose my Ethernet interface and simply close this window, now if I want to start a capture using the Ethernet interface, I can just click the Start a New Live Capture button. I'll click on the Interface List button one more time. We can tell which interface is active just by simply looking at the packets or the packets per second rate. We're not capturing traffic. This is a nice advantage to opening up the Capture Interfaces window first. Wireshark provides us with our IPv6 address if it's available for an interface, and if we click on that entry, we can see the IPv4 address associated with an interface. On the right hand side, we have a Details button. Now this is only available in the Windows version of Wireshark at this time. When I click the Details button, I can see details about the interface. There's a note at the bottom that some drivers may not provide accurate values. Everything you see here is being piped up by the Network Interface Card driver. We can see under the Statistic tab if we have any sort of errors, and if we select 802.3 Ethernet on this item, we can see additional statistics related to errors, underruns, heartbeat failure, etc. If I had selected an 802.11 or a wireless adapter, I would have the ability of selecting the wireless tab to get my interface details. Task offloading will only be active if the driver is passing up information that this interface supports task offloading. Notice that the interface that I'm working on here does support task offloading for IPv6 and IPv4. I'll close this window at this time. Down at the bottom of the Capture Interfaces window, if I have selected one or more adapters in this list, I can click on Start to begin the Start Capture process. There's also a button to open the Options window. The Options window can also be opened directly by clicking on the second button on the main toolbar. I'll close down my Interfaces window and just select the second button, Show the Capture Options, on the main toolbar. This is where we define which interfaces we want to capture on, and if we double-click on one of the interfaces listed, we can edit the interface settings individually. I'll close that window down. Below this you can see we have an option to just capture on all interfaces and to use promiscuous mode on all interfaces and this is the default for Wireshark. If you want to apply a capture filter you can simply type it in at this point and you can see that there's error detection involved. When your capture filter has a green background, it means that the syntax is correct. If you have a typo, a mistake in your capture filter, it will turn the background red. The most common mistake people make is using a display filter syntax in their capture filter. Capture filters use the Berkeley packet filtering format, not the Wireshark proprietary format that display filters use. This is also a Capture Filter button, so I can open up the Capture Filters window and choose a Capture Filter from this list and select OK. We'll cover all of these different options in the Wireshark Core Training Class 3, Capture Traffic. We will focus on Capture Filters in Wireshark Core Training 4, Create and Apply Capture Filters. I'll close this window down. Because in my Capture Interfaces window, I have an adapter already selected, I can just simply click the Start a New Live Capture button to begin the capture process. 
Wireshark will be capturing the traffic on my Ethernet adapter, but I always have to be careful to determine whether or not I have a capture filter in place. Let's stop this capture and go back to my capture options window. I do have a capture filter in place. I'm going to remove that capture filter and then click start. If you want to apply a capture filter, be very selective. Be careful of using too many capture filters. It can be very disappointing when you're looking in a trace file and you realize that some of the important information you were interested in has been filtered out during the capture process. When you're capturing and you want to stop capture, it's obviously going to be the stop the running live capture button. If you want to just restart the capture from this point, Click the Restart button. I'll stop the capture at this time. The next buttons are the Open a Capture File button, Save a Capture File, or Close a Capture File button. After that is Reload a Capture File. If we open a trace file or a capture file, let's say I open up tr-dns-slow, and I choose to turn on name resolution. If the name resolution doesn't work right away, you can always choose to reload the trace file to see if that causes the name resolution to kick in. When you're done with the trace file, you can click close to get back to the start page. I'll open up my recent file. And now the next button that we see is to find a packet. You can find a packet based on a display filter value, such as frame contains, quote, get, all in capital letters. Wireshark will take you to the next instance. You can also find packets based on a hex value or an ASCII string. I could just simply type in get, all in capital letters. By default, it's looking case insensitively. If I want this to be case sensitive, I will select the case sensitive checkbox. The next buttons deal with navigation. If I had found additional packets that contain get, I can use the forward and backwards to move amongst those packets. In addition, the next button takes us to a specific packet based on a packet number. So if I wanted to go to packet number 195, let's say, oh, 195, I'll type that in and click jump to, to jump directly to that packet. If you want to go to the top of the entire packet list pane, click on the go to first packet. This even works when we've sorted the packet list pane. So I've set the time column in an earlier section to view time display format, and second since previous displayed packet. That's now showing me from the end of one packet to the end of the next packet how much time transpired. If I click on the time column heading twice, I'll be sorting from high to low. If I want to know the largest delay in the trace file, I'll click the go to first packet after sorting. And I can see the largest delay is a little over one second and it's packet number two. If I want to see the smallest delay, I can click the go to last packet and see that the smallest delay is zero, and that's packet number one. Packet number one will always start out with a time value of zero, so it usually is the last one when you sort this way. To resort my trace file by its original order, I'll click the number column heading once. The next item turns on and off colorization in the trace file. Some people don't like packet coloring. I think it's great because we can easily see certain packets stand out, such as this ICMP, Destination Unreachable, Port Unreachable. The next button performs auto scrolling during a live capture only. So if I begin a capture at this time and I have auto scrolling enabled, Watch what happens after I get through one screen worth of packets. 
Notice that Wireshark is scrolling, so I'm always able to see the most recent packets. If I click on a packet because I'm interested in learning more about that packet, that won't stop the scrolling. The only way I can stop the scrolling is if I hit the up key or the down key on the keyboard, or just uncheck the auto scroll button. I'll stop the capture at this time. The next buttons focus on the columns, the column widths, and the font size. If this is too hard to read, you can zoom in to increase the font size. It increases the font size not only in the packet list pane, but also in the packet details pane and the packet bytes pane. If I want to go to a smaller font size, I'll choose the zoom out button. If I want to go to the original setting, I'll zoom to 100%, which is the next button. The last button will help in resizing your columns. The next two buttons on the main toolbar are filter buttons. The first button will open up the capture filter window. The second button will open up the display filter window. The button after that allows you to edit the coloring rules. These are permanent coloring rules, not temporary coloring rules. I'll cancel this to close this window. The next to the last button is the Edit Preferences button. This button allows you to change the look of the user interface, including the layout, the columns, the fonts and colors. This also allows you to change the capture settings. The Filter Expressions area allows you to edit your filter expression buttons that are up on your Display Filter toolbar. Name resolution allows you to define how you want MAC name resolution, transport name resolution, network name resolution, and other resolutions to be performed in your trace files. Printing deals with if you're going to be actually printing trace files. And the protocols section, once it's expanded, shows you all the different protocols and applications that have settings that can be changed. So for example, perhaps I'm interested in changing some of the settings for HTTP. I can type in HTTP and Wireshark will take me to that location. If I want to add a port number that should be recognized as HTTP traffic, I'll just add it to the TCP port area. I don't want to keep that, so I'll close this without saving it in a moment. Finally, we have a statistics area that allows you to define some basic functionality of your statistics, such as the maximum visible channels in the RTP player and the packet lengths that you'd like to see when you're looking at packet range information. I'll cancel these out. The last item on the main toolbar is help. This will launch the Wireshark user guide from your local system if that's where it's installed. If it's not installed on your local system, it will go out to the website and get the Wireshark user guide for you. Being comfortable with the functions of the main toolbar will make you much more efficient as a network analyst.